What do you make of that ending? At first, it seems anticlimactic, but the more I thought about it, the more disturbing it became. There's nothing to suggest Howard will be taken into custody. Instead, we must assume the same scary scenario will play out in the next town Howard wanders into. Now, this is the kind of unexpected, ambiguous approach to storytelling Ida Lupino tried to bring to her films. Subversiveness can sneak up on you. It doesn't need to be bombastic. If this film had been made today, Helen, probably played by Jamie Lee Curtis, would of course stab Howard to death in an over-the-top bloodbath finale, only to have his body be gone when the cops show up. Although this is basically a two-hander for Ryan and Lupino, a couple of members of the supporting cast rate a mention. Mr. Armstrong is played by Taylor Holmes, familiar to noir fans for memorable roles in Kiss of Death, Nightmare Alley, and Act of Violence. He and Lupino went way back, in fact, Holmes reminded Lupino that this production was a reunion of sorts for them. He'd performed with her father, Stanley Lupino, on the London stage in 1920. And it was his job to keep Ida from crying because she was only two years old at the time. Helen's niece, Ruth, was played by 15-year-old Barbara Whiting. Her father, composer Richard Whiting, wrote such classics as Ain't We Got Fun, on the good ship Lollipop and Hooray for Hollywood. Her sister, Margaret Whiting, was a popular singer in the 40s and 50s, and the two of them co-starred on the TV sitcom Those Whiting Girls, a summer replacement for I Love Lucy from 1955 to 57. Margaret later married Jack Wrangler, the biggest name in the annals of gay porn. A story for another time. As I mentioned at the top, director Harry Horner was a protege of theater legend Max Reinhardt. Despite the all-American name, he was born in Czechoslovakia when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He joined Reinhardt's theater company in Vienna in the early 1930s, and when the impresario immigrated to America in 1935, Horner came with him. He was one of Reinhardt's most trusted and versatile protégés. His career as a designer began almost accidentally when Reinhardt, unhappy with the work of art director Norman Belgetti's, assigned Horner to create all new sets for a Broadway production of the musical The Eternal Road. Not only that, Horner doubled as conductor of the orchestra. Musical talent ran in the family. Harry Horner's son, James Horner, was one of the most prolific film composers of recent times, with scores that include Braveheart, Apollo 13, A Beautiful Mind, and Titanic. Harry Horner never directed another feature after 1956, but he returned to production design, winning a second Oscar for 1961's The Hustler. After that, he worked on an eclectic array of pictures, including They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, Up the Sandbox, and Harry and Walter Go to New York, and Walter Hill's existential neo-noir The Driver. Horner had this to say about current trends in movies. There's a big movement towards the spectacle. It's a bad move and should be counteracted. The movies are going all out and trying to fill big screens with mass movement. Eventually, they'll get back to people and simple emotion again. He said that in 1954. Even though we're taking a break for the holidays, check in with us on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. And maybe you want to plan a trip to Noir City. Our initial festival of 2024 will take place January 19th to the 28th at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California. Just a couple of martinis from here. And during this joyous holiday season, please refrain from killing any spouses, loved ones, or family members during festive celebrations. I hope I see you next year. In the shadows, of course.